right, well thank you everybody for coming to uh, Science on Tap, welcome. Uh, great turnout, uh, really appreciate everybody stepping out. Um, before, we, before we introduce the speaker, I'd like to remind you of a couple things. Um, Science on Tap is, is a, a laid back environment. If you guys are in need of a beverage, please uh, flag down the waitresses that will be coming to the, to the end here and they'll do their best to uh, bring a full tray of beers for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all for him, so um, my tray will be next, I guess. Um, goodness. Um, speaking of beer, every pint that's sold, uh, the bio station and the Flathead Lakers get to split a, a dollar of the proceeds. So we're, we're drinking for cause and it's a, it's a great event. Um, it helps maintain our website and, and, and some advertising. And uh, every every beer counts, so um, drink responsibly. I guess I'll say that. Um, um, all right. So at the the uh, science on tap is meant to be laid back. If you have, uh, we we sort of leave how how the the proceeds go up to the speaker. If he welcomes questions during the presentation. Absolutely. All right. So please uh, speak up if you have a question during it, and, and usually there's a, a presentation and then a, a Q and A session afterwards. And so far, the Q and A have been the highlight of the of the evening, I think. So um, think of, think of good questions and, and let let them have it. Um, <laughs> we are we're, we're we're really thankful for everybody coming out. The turnout's great. We have the other the other room filled up, so uh, that's 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 great news as well. Um, I'm really pleased with the turnout this evening. Um, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Hillary. She's going to tell you a little bit about the Flathead Lakers. Not much. We had our annual planning meeting today, and I talked all day long. But <laughs> the gist of it is we have an exciting year coming up with a lot of great um, projects that we're involved in. And I also know that the Flathead Lake Biological Station has great energy and enthusiasm right now with their new faculty and and new projects that are going on. So it's a great time to become a part of the, the lake community that watches, that protects the lake and, and keeps an eye out for things. And so I encourage you to become a Flathead Laker member and to also be um, a, a donor to the Flathead Lake Biological Station because we do great work out there. We have a great year coming up. I can just feel it. Thank you. All right. Um, any Flathead Laker members, raise your hand tonight. So if you have any questions about what the Flathead Lakers does and what they're all about, please uh, feel free to talk with anyone who put their hand down just now. Um, and, or Hillary, or uh, um, Robin is here. That we have, we, there's good representation. Anybody from the Flathead Lake Biological Station here tonight? Over there. Come on, no. There's, uh, there's, there's Monica. All right, I'll raise my hand. Jim, Jim, put your hand way up. There you go. Um, if you have any questions about what's going on at the bio station, we are more than happy to discuss it and, and eager to do so. Um, there's a lot happening on the lake. There's a lot going on to the Lakers, so we, we'd love to grab your ear and, and discuss it if you have any questions. Um, all right, so uh, I've mentioned the fact that beer is good. Um, I've mentioned the Lakers and the station. All right, so I think we can move on to our speaker tonight. So I think everybody in the room is pretty eager to hear about some Osprey news and, and, and understand what's going on with Ospreys and how they can help us. So tonight we have Dr. Eric Green, who is a professor in the biological sciences at uh, University of Montana down in Missoula. He's made the long trip up over the missions around the lake, um, went over the animal bridge, all the good things. It's been quite a day for him. So. Uh, <laughs> We're, part of Science on Tap is to hopefully in, engage campus and, and make some uh, better and stronger connections between the biological station and campus, and I think this is our first, our first UM professor, so to speak, that has come up. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Beer down for a second. As a, as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to give you a map of Flathead Lake. They, uh, <laughs> Looks, looks great in your office, and uh, where the bio station is, is marked right there, so you won't forget where we are. Uh, if anybody else has interest in a map tonight, you can talk to Tom Bansack, who is in the other room, um, and, and uh, or talk to me or Hillary, and we, we have maps here. We have a Whitefish Lake map, we have Flathead Lake maps, 
both like the one that Eric got and then uh, laminated uh, waterproof ones as well. So if you're interested, they're $20 a pop and a, a great investment. Um, they look really nice. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand the microphone over. Let's hear about some Ospreys. Thank you. Thanks so much, folks. This is a wonderful turnout. And uh, hi, you guys in the overflow room back there. If the volume is, uh, somebody come running in and let me know if you, you can't hear me. Uh, before I start, I've got to say I, there's a definite conflict going on here. I have a beer, a slide advancer, and a microphone. And one of these is going to lose it. It's not going to be the beer. <laughs> Well, it might have to be, but um, yeah, so this is meant to be really informal and please, if you've got questions as we go along, uh, feel free to just uh, put your hand up and jump right in um, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. All right, um, yeah, so we're super lucky here in, in Western Montana. Uh, we're living in a real hot spot for ospreys and especially here on Flathead Lake um, and the Flathead River and so forth. And all of you guys are, are really lucky um, because they're so common here. I'm going to give you a broad, um, really quick overview of what uh, my colleagues and I have been, what we're calling Montana Osprey Project, and uh, what we've been doing for the last 10 years or so on ospreys around Montana. Could you hold the mic a little closer to your Okay, thanks. How's that? Okay, good. And. Um, this is really gratifying for me because I actually did my undergraduate thesis work on ospreys, and this is um, back in Halifax, Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. This was actually when there was still Glacial Lake Missoula was here, so this is a lot of fun. But it's been really fun in, in, um, since I've been here to start um, getting back into ospreys. So, and what I'm going to tell you is done, I've got several partners in crime on this project, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about has been done with um, Rob Dominich, who is um, the executive director of a group he started called Raptor View Research Foundation in Missoula, and he's one of the world's leading experts on raptor conservation and migration, so um, a lot of what I, I tell you about is uh, done with him. How's the mic? Is that, is that better? Louder? Louder. Okay, how's that? All right, so um, so ospreys are super specialized fishing raptors. They are um, really, really cool. They've got all sorts of neat adaptations for hunting fish. They're found on every continent except the Antarctic. And most families of animals, most families of birds, for example, have many genera and many species. Ospreys are so unique in many respects that there's only one species in the family, the osprey. They're found, again, all over the world except the Antarctic. They're, um, got, they're um, amazing at doing what they're built to do, which is catch fish. And I've seen them do this several times. Several times. Um, they come, come up with, with double fish. Um, actually, when they're hunting smelt, they can come up with 10 smell one they just break through spawning smell and so uh, right now um how many of you've seen ospreys catch a fish okay well this is cool we're, we're in flathead lake <laughs> i'm going to show you a couple of movies that um two movies clips that demonstrate some very cool stuff about ospreys fishing All right, um, there's no sound. There's sound on this movie, but it's not getting through, so I'm gonna have to do the sound effects. <laughs> so, here's a soon-to-be ex-flounder. And this is a, a, a flatfish, it's a chameleon. It can change its color, so it's completely cryptic. So how these ospreys see these things from way up is amazing. Now watch, what I want you to notice is when the osprey commits to the dive, which is right here. Okay, so you'll see it makes small corrections. Um, it might hit the water at 100 miles an hour. And now watch. Okay, and I'm going to 
show this again. Uh, what I want you to notice is, you can imagine if um, the Osprey hit the water 100 miles an hour with its wings straight out, it would just rip its wings off. And so they've got, um, they can actually dislocate their shoulders and watch just before it hits the water, it dislocates its shoulders, puts them straight above its head and it goes in like an Olympic diver. Um, they also have to compensate for refraction. So a fish underwater isn't where it looks like. So they're doing um, physics on the fly, literally. <laughs> Sorry. They have to compute. They're not diving at where the fish actually is. Yep. Count your seconds, Flounder. <laughs> now watch it uh, throw its wings back just before it hits the water. Okay. Yeah, yeah, boobies and gannets, a lot of diving birds that hit the water going really fast go in like that. Boobies go in head first, these guys go in feet first, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, he would be, okay. <laughs> this, this is super slow motion, this is filmed in Scotland, and uh, what this is going to demonstrate is that often ospreys latch onto fish that are humongous, that might weigh two or three times uh, the, the, the weight of a male osprey. And so what you're going to see here is this, this is a, a young, this is a male osprey, he's latched onto a big trout, and the trout is still alive, and the trout is diving for the bottom of the lake, and so there's this often this tug of war. And so if you think about it, this osprey might have a, a five pound fish and he might be carrying two, three, four pounds of water as he's trying to lift off. And so, so these guys have a huge, huge keel. And this is where the pectoralis, the, the flight muscle, the breast muscle attaches. So you can see uh, this guy couldn't get off. So if there's fish people in the audience, they usually go, go fish! And the bird people usually go, go osprey! Um, and so, now also watch how the wings are articulated so it can flap without hitting the water as it's trying to take off, okay? So, this guy makes it, but there are records of ospreys latching onto humongous salmon and they're latched on so tightly um, that the salmon dies, dives, and the osprey drowns, and then the salmon dies and, and they get washed up. So people have been watching be beach combing and find a, a dead salmon and a dead osprey hooked together. So, um, Can you talk I about saw the that happen on the Flathead River. <laughs> What's that? Eagles, how they carry it, the osprey carry it. Yeah, yeah so the ospreys, um, <laughs> when they carry it, you saw that? I saw it as a, as a, as a boy I, on the right up here on Foy's Bend. What, as a as a teenager, I saw an osprey drowned by a, what presumably was a large bull trout. Wow. Uh, okay. It disappeared. So it, 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 it does. It does. Never made yeah. it back. It, <laughs> yeah, it does happen. Um, so when ospreys time, start one flying, time. what's that? One more time. What you talk about? Uh, I think we're good. We're good. So um, ospreys, especially if they have to fly long distances to the nests, their nests, um, they will line up the fish like this and they'll, they'll carry them like that, like underneath them for aerodynamic purposes. Um, and sometimes ospreys will go considerable distances, like 20 miles, I, I did a lot of studies in Nova Scotia, they will go long distances to fish, so sometimes they'll be flying 20 miles with a fish if it's worth it. All right. Could you repeat the questions? Yes. Like, okay. Okay. Sorry, other room. We will repeat the questions. <laughs> um, all right. So one of the reasons that we're, we've started studying ospreys around here is we're using them as really sensitive indicators of the health of aquatic systems. And the reason um, that ospreys are so good for this purpose is that they're at the very top of the food chain in aquatic systems. So they're eating large fish, 
which are eating smaller fish, which may be eating smaller fish, which are eating aquatic invertebrates, which are um, eating, eating things um, uh, below them. And so if there's an environmental contaminants in a system, every step up the food chain, the contaminants uh, become magnified. This is called uh, bioamplification. And a rule, a general rule of thumb is that every step you move up a trophic level, uh, the concentration of toxins becomes about 10 times greater. So we can see um, in the top predators, apex predators in the aquatic system, the contamination levels can be tens of thousands of times greater than what it is at the, the, the bottom of the food chain. So um, we've been using ospreys as in our studies of ecotoxicology that I'll tell you more about. This is also of great interest and concern because who eats fish around here that you might catch, right? So um, if we're finding crud and crap in the aquatic system, uh, there's implications for human health, um, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> Ospreys, so I'm going to tell you more about our ecotoxicology studies, but I'd just like to point out that ospreys have been incredibly important species historically for helping us understand environmental problems. And here's a, a graph just showing you the kind of history of osprey populations in North America. There's no axes on the, the y-axis there, the vertical axes. But there were lots and lots of ospreys around back in the 1910s, 20s. Lots of ospreys up here. And then, oops, okay, I'll, I'll figure this out by the end of the night. Um, in 1873, a German chemist uh, synthesized DDT. He was just an organic chemist mixing up stuff, and he, and he came up with this one compound. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize for making this stuff. He didn't really know what it would be useful for. Um, and then in 1939, another German chemist, uh, Dr. Paul Mueller, discovered that DDT, DDT is a um, very potent insecticide. It kills insects. And so uh, World War I rolled around, and all the guys were in, in foxholes and trenches. They were all covered with lice. And so um, they said, well, and they sent DDT powder and everybody was shaking DDT powder all over themselves to keep the lice down. And then after World War I, um, DDT was used widely across North America, sprayed on crops as an insecticide. And here's what happened. Oh, by the way, uh, Paul Mueller won a Nobel Prize for recognizing that DDT killed insects. And here's a DDT molecule, um, and I'll tell you more about this. But here's what happened shortly after World War One, when uh, World War Two, when DDT was being widely applied to agricultural fields in North America, the populations plummeted, and um, in many areas in North America, they almost went extinct. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, and so ospreys, nobody knew knew the mechanism. There was no link. Um, between DDT and and birds at the top of the food chain um, declining like this, um, and it was studies, very important wildlife studies that led to this recognition that DDT was the culprit. And here's how it works: um, female ospreys have an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, and what it does, its job is to grab. Um, calcium out of the bloodstream of the females when they're developing eggs and it takes the calcium and lays it down and makes the egg shell. So it's the enzyme that takes calcium and makes the egg shell. This molecule actually has a, a very strong affinity for what's called the active site, the business part of the enzyme. So it gums, gums up the enzyme and it's not able to do its job and grab calcium and make the egg shell. So ospreys were laying eggs that had paper thin eggshells, and when they sat to incubate them, they would break. And it was ospreys and also other species at the top of their food chains, um, such as bald eagles and peregrine falcons, which were so showing similar sorts of crashes. 
And very quickly, wildlife biologists got on this and realized what the problem was. And so this led to, in 1972, U.S. Congress, as soon as the science, it was kind of, it's refreshing looking back in history when science actually informs policy. <laughs> Congress kind of unanimously jumped all over this and in 1972 banned the use of DDT. And here's what's really encouraging. After the 72 ban, here's what the populations of ospreys did. They recovered remarkably quickly in a lot of places. Um, and so, um, yeah, so this is a very encouraging uh, thing. Yes. DDT is still used like in South America. Yes. So, so Congress banned the use of DDT in the U.S. Uh, U.S. chemical companies are still making DDT and exporting it, so it's used in other places in the world, yep. including some places where ospreys from here go and migrate. Do you have a curve like that um, for this area? For, as yes. Comparison yeah. To yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I'll repeat the question for you guys in the other room. And um, so the question is, um, is there a curve like this for ospreys around here? And we've got a person in the audience who can um, talk about this, but um, this is pretty general. All across North America, we saw similar sorts of things. Down in the Bitterroot, um, the best uh, census data for ospreys um, in the Bitterroot was Lee Metcalf National Wildlife Refuge. There had been about 40 ospreys nesting in Lee Metcalf. Um, in here, it went down to zero, or one nest, one active nest. So it went from 40 to about one. Um, and so in a lot of places around here, they went locally extinct. But not right here. Yeah, they went way, way down. So um, I'll, t I'll talk about this in just a minute, yeah. So ospreys, um, in the along the Flathead River and the Flathead Lake were way, way down from what they are now. And that brings me to, um, <laughs> I'm going to embarrass somebody here. So we're really lucky to have Doug McCarter here. Um, so Doug and his twin brother Don, who lives over in Livingston, did some really, really important osprey research. So Doug's right here. And we owe him and his brother. Um, Still have my beard. Thanks. <laughs> we, we owe uh, him and his brother for um, great contributions to society. They introduced short shorts. <laughs> Yeah, gators and short shorts. I mean, when is this look going to come back? <laughs> and um, and so he and his brother uh, did some really, really important studies during the time that we're talking about. Uh, they did complete censuses of ospreys on Flathead Lake and, and around here. And so it was some of their work that um, documented these severe declines around here. Um, that led in part to the concern and the, the research that led to this 1972 ban on, on short shorts. No, on, on, on DDT. And I also have to say that, um, that um, Doug and his brother, they funded their research in a very interesting way, um, by selling drugs. <laughs> They were actually known as the Cough Drop Brothers. Um, yeah. <laughs> but they're still at it, so here's Doug and his brother. Uh, they're, so they're still doing, um, actively doing osprey research, and I think the first censuses you did here were over 45 years ago. So um, we owe a huge debt um, to Doug and his brother, so we're really lucky to have them. They, they call them the little crackheads too. So we owe them a great debt for their osprey research, maybe not for the short shorts. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that ospreys are uh, really, really um, neat to study is that they're exceedingly common around here. We're very lucky about it. 
They also, their nests are really easy to find. And essentially you just add water, right? You got ospreys. And they are one of the, they are the raptor that is the most tolerant of human activity and presence of any raptor. Like if you want to study goshawks, good luck. You might send out like 50 people into the forest and find two nests and, it, and those two nests, they kill you, right? Um, but they nest um, all over the place. This is our um, nest in the center field of our Osprey, um, Osprey baseball um, team in Missoula. Unfortunately, they really suck. I mean, it's just not right when the chuckers beat the ospreys. I mean, prey should not be beating predators, right? But this is in the center field of, um, in Missoula. This is one of my favorite nests. Uh, this is on an old sort of shovel. Uh, this is on Mullen Road, right near the Super Walmart in Missoula. And uh, so the guy who owns this, like once a summer, he'll go um, turn it on and, and drive around a little bit just to make sure the engine's still working. And the ospreys will bump around on top. And, and so ospreys are really, really um, a nice species to study because they're, they're so common and um, easy to find their nests. All right, so I'm going to tell you now about what we're calling our um, uh, Montana Osprey Project. We view it as a three-legged stool, and we're doing research on ecotoxicology, using ospreys to tell us about the health of aquatic systems. We're doing a lot of public education uh, using ospreys because they're so popular. Everybody uh, loves ospreys. Um, and we're also doing a lot of work with um, conservation and raising some important issues. Okay, let me tell you, uh, so I'm gonna walk through all three of those things that we're doing. Let me tell you more about our research um, using ospreys to gauge the health of aquatic ecosystems. We started this part of the project in association with the removal of the Milltown Dam. So this is one of the largest EPA Superfund sites in the country. So just to orient you, so Missoula, oh, this isn't really showing up, but you can see Missoula up here, uh, Butte Anaconda is down here, and so there was uh, copper mining and copper smelting in Butte and Anaconda. The uh, mine, the tailings after um, the copper was extracted was just thrown right next to the Clark Fork River around Warm Springs. And so for the last 100 plus years, every um, those toxic sediments uh, were washing down the Clark Fork River and then precipitating out behind Milltown Dam. So um, when the EPA Superfund project started, people were talking about what they call the big five heavy metals. So these were the things that were super concentrated um, in, in the sediments. These are uh, copper, arsenic, lead, cadmium, and zinc. And so uh, when the, in, in conjunction with the dam coming out and the, this huge restoration, this very exciting restoration project that's been taking place on the Clark Fork River, we've been using ospreys to gauge how contaminated the river still is and, and, and if the restoration project is, is really working the way we had hoped it would. Um, so here's a picture of Butte at its heyday. And um, way back when people, there was no damn government EPA to tell us what to do. And so um, these smelters, there was a lot of smoke going down into the Butte Valley and cows and horses around Butte were dropping over dead um, because of the, the smelter smoke. Um, and so the solution to that was build a rail line to Anaconda and do the smelting in Anaconda so the horses and cows near Anaconda fell over again, but not near you, okay? So that was the solution back then. And so here's a picture um, for those of you, um, I, I was really lucky living near Missoula, I could watch this um, happening, but here's the old Milltown Dam and um, precipitated behind the dam was about 50 to 60 feet of toxic sludge that was um, full of arsenic and cadmium and zinc and lead and copper. And just to give you an idea of how 
concentrated some of these um, heavy metals were, um, I found on the floodplain up here, um, before they did this, you could walk along and find, say, deer bones or cow bones in the floodplain, and copper is right below calcium in the periodic table, and copper can replace calcium. So if you got a bone, it's, it's all calcium. So I found cow bones that are bright green, it just, just lying on the ground. And so there's enough copper in the soil that the copper molecules replace the calcium. And so I go over and try to pick them up and they weigh about 30 pounds because they're solid copper. Um, yeah. But um, so this restoration project, the dam is out. Um, about 50 or 60 feet of the sludge was um, excavated and uh, sent by train back to Mama. So it's now back up near um, um, Anaconda, Opportunity Ponds, and put in a much, we hope, a much safer place that it's not going to get back in the river. And now we live in a very historic time because the uh, Army Corps of Engineers loves to put in dams, but they don't come out all that often. So this is a very, very exciting thing that's happened. And you can see the Blackfoot River is coming in here. It's a different color. And the Clark Fork is coming down. So this is the confluence of the, the Blackfoot and the Clark Fork. We now have fish migration starting up again. Um, and so these rivers are really functioning in a much more natural way. And you can see the, the riparian um, vegetation and marshes. So. What we've decided to do is we are monitoring a lot of osprey nests all over western Montana and a bunch of other states. And here's just a little bit about the methods. So we go up in these big bucket trucks um, and here's what we see when we do this. Uh, we see some osprey chicks and we do an alien abduction. So we grab them, take them down to the ground. Um, Another reason ospreys are great to work on is because their de the, the chicks, their defensive mechanism when you go up is... <laughs> so it's yeah. like if I don't look at you, if I don't see you, you don't see me. Um, and so we ban them and we make them honorary members of the Sucky Osprey Baseball Team. And we, we take um, small blood samples. So, whoops. So we take small blood samples from the brachial vein, which is this vein, major vein in your wrist, and um, feather samples. And we can catch the adults, um, and we do occasionally, it's, it's a lot harder than going up and grabbing the babies, but for this ecotoxicology work, we're much more interested in the contamination levels in the babies, rather than the adults. Now, why? Why might we not be so interested in the contamination levels of the adults? About when? What's that? It's about when? Yeah. When in their cycle? Right? What do you mean by that? The beginning of the cycle. Not after so, the are there ospreys around here now? Yeah. Uh, maybe a few. Yeah. A few left. Most of them are, are down sitting on a beach in Costa Rica, sipping the mai tais right now. Um, and so. If we were to, um, so the ospreys migrate, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. They spend eight to nine months, actually they spend more of their life in their wintering grounds than they do here in the breeding grounds. So if we took a blood sample from the ospreys, the, the adults, um, we don't know, and it's, let's say it's full of crud, we don't know where they got it. It could have been, they might be sitting on top of a gold mine in Peru for all we know. And so we can't say that that contamination is related to the Clark Fork River. But if you think about it, um, all of that biomass in a chick, all of that tissue grew from fish that was from a mile or two from that nest, right? So what we see in the blood of a chick tells us about the condition of the river right there, okay? And so we can create these very high resolution maps um, of, of the contamination levels. So that's why we're focusing on the, the, the babies. Uh, we have a really fine um, environmental chemistry lab at the University of Montana where we do all the analysis. And l l let me just tell you, <laughs> let me just tell you, yeah, before I get um, really downer, I better take a beer. A, a beer. <laughs> yeah, everybody take a sip of beer, please. Um, so 
the good news is that um, the big five heavy metals that I've talked about, copper, arsenic, zinc, cadmium, and lead, which had been the whole motivation for taking out the Clark, the, the Milltown Dam and doing this um, big restoration project, which is still going on, um, those levels are really, really low in the ospreys, all up and down the Clark Fork River, which is great. It's showing that this uh, restoration project is really, really working. Now, um, when this project started, nobody was talking about mercury. We've analyzed all these samples we get from mercury as well, and um, mercury is not in the crud from the, the copper mining. Okay, so there's no mercury associated with the tailings, the copper tailings. But what we're finding is um, huge, huge, um, scary levels of mercury in ospreys um, in some parts of the Clark Fork River and other places. Let me tell you a little bit more about mercury. So um, mercury is one of the most toxic substances um, around. Plutonium is a little bit more toxic, but right now there's fortunately not a lot of plutonium full ground. Um, but uh, mercury is a really potent neurotoxin and, um, and it really messes with development of vertebrates. This is a really um, a pretty moving picture. <coughs> This is uh, uh, Ryoko, um, the mom, giving a bath to her 12-year-old daughter, Tomoko. And um, they lived in uh, Minamata. Mercury poisoning in humans is called Minamata disease. And um, this was a fishing village in Minamata, and there was a plastics factory. Um, and they were using methyl mercury um, to manufacture plastic, and they were dumping methyl mercury right into the ocean. It got into the food chain, concentrated, and so it was in large levels in the fish. This is a fishing community. So Ryoko was eating fish when she was pregnant with her daughter, Tomoko. This is in Japan, yes. So the question was, folks over there in the overflow, yes, this is in Japan. So um, you can see um, Tomoko is a mess, and she died shortly after this photo was taken. This photo is also pretty moving for another reason. Uh, Eugene Smith, a very famous photographer, uh, he broke, he was a whistleblower, he kind of broke the story. He took these photos in this fishing village in Minamata, and it was published in 1972 in Life magazine. The, the plastics factory didn't like this bad press, and so they sent their company goons out, and they, they beat Eugene Smith. Um, so badly he lost his eyesight, they broke his limbs, he almost died for publishing this photo. Um, so this is a very moving photo, in, again in people, um, mercury poisoning is called Minamata disease. Missoula is, it's kind of ironic, but fitting in a way, Missoula is a sister city of Minamata. Um, so we're tied um, by a link to mercury. And in Minamata, there's a very cool, they, they've actually done a lot about mercury, much more so than we have done here in Montana, and they've got a great um, mercury museum in Minamata. Um, let me just help you calibrate what I'm going to talk about. Um, for humans, the various medical and scientific bodies have set an upper limit of five units, let's call this parts per billion, it's, it's pretty approximate, I mean it's pretty close to parts per billion, five parts per billion of mercury in your blood. So for humans, anything above five parts per billion is considered um, unsafe, and it causes what doctors call cognitive dysfunction, which means it makes you stupid, okay? Or it causes you, if you're developing fetus, to end up like uh, poor Tomoko there. So bear this in mind, um, this five. And actually this is being revised down now. This is considered too high. This is astounding if you think about it. This is like five molecules of mercury in a billion parts of blood, right? So this is showing you it does not take much um, to cause severe problems. Okay, here's what, here, I'm, this is one of the few data slides I'm gonna show you. This is what we've been finding with um, mercury levels in osprey. Let me walk you through this graph. So this is Warm Springs Pond. So this is um, up near uh, Drummond, uh, Anaconda. This is going down the Clark Fork River. 
So this is um, Deer Lodge, Drummond, and Missoula down here. You can see mercury levels um, are in the 100 to 200 range in Osprey Chicks up at the top, but then something happens right around Drummond. They go through the um, roof. They go up to five, six, seven hundred parts per billion. And then there's, a, as you go downriver, um, you see there's a washout. But we've got a lot of mercury and osprey chicks in this part of the uh, western Montana. Let me show you this line. Just remember, this is what is considered the upper tolerable level, level for humans. So you can see all along the Clark Fork, mercury levels are way, way, way above that. If any one of you walked into the hospital in Kalispell with mercury levels like that, it would be code red. The doctors would be freaking out, pushing the button, getting the chelation team over there ASAP. Okay, so we've got lots and lots of ospreys um, with mercury levels that are way too high. So this is one of the things that we found out unexpectedly from our research. Um, some of the good news up here is mercury levels here are, are way lower than this. Does mercury not interact in the development of the fetus? Uh, I'll talk about, so the question was, what does it do to developing ospreys? And that's one of the big questions we're after. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the last 10 years going over to Helena and talking to Governor Schweitzer and Governor Bullock and the heads of the Fish Wildlife and DEQ and stuff. And 10 years ago or so, it was like, you shouldn't die and get out of here. Don't talk about mercury. We don't want to hear it. It's, it's a, um, we've got a million dollar trout fishing industry here, don't raise the issue. Um, so um, it was not a message that politicians wanted to hear a while ago. Now it's really changed because I think a lot, we've been doing a lot of education about this, and so ranchers will ask their legislators, what are you doing about the mercury levels in our streams? And so now there's actually some really exciting um, projects going about, on about trying to figure out where this mercury is coming from and how to um, maybe get these levels down. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out where the mercury is coming from. It's not from the original uh, Butte Anaconda copper tailings. It's from old gold mines. And here's, this is a picture I took um, when I was flying my plane over um, Drummond. This is the Clark Fork. This is Flint Creek, little old Flint Creek that you could jump across coming in from Drummond. Most of the mercury in the Clark Fork system is coming in through that tiny little creek um, from old gold and silver mines up behind Phillipsburg. So there's some um, projects going on right now. Um, DEQ and others, our uh, Department of Environmental Quality, is like trying to find out where this mercury is and get, get rid of it. So there's, there's some stuff happening. You're just so full of questions. Well, you're so interesting. <laughs> so, how about um, uh, mercury containing coal from uh, Western? Okay, yeah. So, I've got some scary slides of that. You're going um, to my, you're gonna get to my uh, flatted curve, too, right? Uh, I, I might, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so the. Uh, so the mercury in the Clark Fork system and a lot of these aquatic systems is from 100-year-old gold mines. So mercury, back then people didn't know it was as toxic, and so, but mercury um, is really good at, it's like a magnet, it, it amalgamates with little gold flakes and silver flakes, and so, you know the old, the, the guys, panning for gold, and the bigger operations, I'll show, I can show you some pictures of those, they would load up their, their pans or um, whatever they were using with mercury, and then at the end of the day, I mean, they were lucky if they found a gold nugget, but most of the stuff they were after was kind of almost microscopic flakes. So then they would um, boil off the mercury, and that would leave the, the like gold. Like in Peru now. Yeah, that's what's going on in Peru and other places now. So um, what we're seeing coming out of this tiny little creek is from old gold and silver mines. All right, so this is onto one of your questions. So when we found these levels of mercury that were just through the roof, orders of magnitude that higher than would be accepted in humans, you know, we had to wonder what is this doing to the ospreys? 
And so, if you think about it, late in the season when the chicks, you know, the nests are way up there and you can't count little tiny chicks or eggs, but once the babies get big enough and they're flapping around that you can count them, let's say you see two chicks in a nest. Well, did those two chicks come from two eggs? Or was it three eggs and, and only two chicks were it? Or four eggs and only two chicks made it? So what we've been using is, um, I've been flying a lot of drones so it's a little hard to tell how big this helicopter is, but it's a little tiny one. Um, we've got cameras on these. And this was not too long after 9-11, and the FAA from Washington, I got a call from Homeland Security, who said you are not gonna fly these drones anymore. And um, yeah, so that's a very interesting story. Um, and so we fly these drones, um, well, Homeland Security shut us down for a while, but we're now back up flying. And you can see here's a drone um, flying over an osprey nest, and they're kind of like, what is that big mosquito? But here's, here's the sort of photos that we can get with these drones. So we can count eggs and chicks. Um, and we've got it down now so we can fly over these nests in about um, five seconds and take these pictures. Very, very safe. So this is typically what we find, unfortunately. Here's a chick that's hatched with two dead eggs. And whenever we go out in these areas of high mercury, I come back with buckets of dead osprey eggs. It turns out about half of the osprey eggs, the embryos die in the areas of high mercury. And I mean, think of, think of this. If, like parts of the Clark Fork, if women were losing, 50% of pregnant women were losing their babies, um, this is kind of the order of magnitude of what we're talking about. So we're seeing huge egg mortality in parts of the Clark Fork River still. That was completely unknown. One of the mysteries is that if a chick hatches, they seem to do all right. There's, there's no increased mortality and they seem to fledge okay. So we're working on this. This guy might, it's really kind of easy to be an osprey chick. You just open your mouth and your parents shove fish in your face. But um, the parents leave them. They don't teach them to migrate. They don't teach them to fish. So if this osprey is suffering from cognitive impairment, as the doctors say, you know, maybe it's not going to live too long after it fledges. So that's kind of one thing we're working on now. All right. Um, so I'm gonna move on um, and talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing about trying to figure out where ospreys go. Um, as I said, they spend most of their lives somewhere else, and we had no idea where it was before we started this project. So in collaboration with uh, Rob Dominich and others, we've been putting these small uh, solar-powered satellite transmitters on, on ospreys. And so you can see there's some little tiny wires coming out of the back. This is a very famous chick, Blue 54. Her name is Rapunzel. The, the, uh, the girl who lives on this ranch, she named, this is Scooter and Rapunzel. And we just put um, satellite transmitters on them and uh, to reward them for the indignity of this, we gave them a golden trout that we got at um, the good food store. So, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, they ignored it. it. Yeah, they were like, eh, I don't know. Good food story, you bleeding heart liberals. Okay, so uh, these things are, are really pretty tiny. There you can see a little solar panel here. So we've got lots and lots of these out on Ospreys. We've got them programmed to send a signal up to an Argos satellite once an hour. So once an hour, we know where all these birds are within about 10 feet. And some of these birds, uh, Rapunzel is now five years old. We know where she's been within 10 feet the last five years. We're getting incredible information about where these birds go. Um, this is about how much these transmitters weigh. Um, and for an osprey that can carry a 10, 10 pound fish, this um, um, is, is not much. Uh, so we started getting pictures. I get tons of pictures like this. Rapunzel is a celebrity. Here she is, Blue 54. You can see the satellite transmitter on her. She's molted. This is her first winter. Um, this is down in Texas. And so I got this picture. She winters on the Gulf of Mexico. She found her way there all by herself after hanging out at a commercial 
catfish pond in Oklahoma for about a month. And they're like, no, you are gonna get shot there. But she made her way down um, to a beautiful, so she was born in this beautiful spot near Lolo on the Bitterroot River. Here's the beautiful spot she's chosen to spend her winters in. Oh, here, so here's another picture of her. Here's some of the satellites. This is about a week of satellite data. And um, this is this area. This is a, a um, oil refinery and a Dow chemical plant with a um, industrial canal. So it just shows you beauties in the eye of the beholder. To Rapunzel, this looks beautiful. And here's where she sleeps every night for the last five winters. She sleeps on one of those towers. So she's there right now, asleep on one of those towers. And she goes out and fishes there. And, and we've been following her around now for five years. And um, so she's just one. She hasn't bred yet. She hooked up with a boyfriend two summers ago, but they didn't raise any babies. And we were really hopeful that she would raise babies last summer. She's got a nest down near uh, Phillipsburg in the Upper Rock Creek, um, but she hasn't raised any babies of her own yet. So we're hoping next year is the year. This is pretty typical, young birds. It's really hard to develop the fishing skills uh, to feed babies and stuff. So these they can live 15, 20, 25 years is really old, but they typically don't start breeding until they're three, four, five years old. So. Uh, males come back, so the question was um, where do they end up? The males tend to stick around close to where they were born. The females disperse a little farther. Um, so we're, we're hopeful. All right, um, so here's another thing we've stumbled across um, in the course of this research that we didn't expect to find. What's the dealing with baleen twine? So I'm sure you guys all recognize a bright orange osprey nest. Ospreys for some reason love to pick up weird crap and put it in their nest. So um, I found a bikini in the nest, um, top and bottom, and I think uh, there were some people out skinny dipping on the river and left their seats on the lot, and they said thank you very much. But um, they love to, they have a, a special predilection for picking up baling twine. In other parts of the world where I've studied osprey, um, they line their nests with bright orange lichens. Um, it's really nice and soft, and so I don't know if, if that's the reason, but they pick up a lot of baleen twine. Um, this is a big problem because it's um, a polypropylene rope that never decomposes, basically. It can last for a thousand years or so in the environment, and although it's nice and soft, they get hideously tangled up and a lot of ospreys die. About 10% of ospreys in some areas, chicks and adults, die because of um, baleen twine. We, I get hundreds of calls every summer of, about ospreys uh, tangled up in this stuff. And we, we try to, if we get to them soon enough, we're able to rescue them. And I know Doug has gone out and rescued ospreys tangled up like this. Um, Often when we go up to sample chicks, we'll find something like this, an orange ball with a osprey chick head sticking out of it. And so um, this one we were able to save if we hadn't got there within a day or two, it probably would have died. You can see it's, that foot is all swollen. Um, the, the rope had cut down to the bone in its leg. But we did some surgery and gave it antibiotics and, and we went back and it, it survived. Often, though, we find just the remains of dead chicks all tangled up in, in rope. And th we see this um, quite, quite often. So if a uh, baling twine gets wrapped around a chick's leg when it's really small, as it grows, it constricts the blood and its leg can fall off. So we find just legs in nests. This chick fledged with one leg, amazingly enough, but it was doomed. There's no way it could be a confident osprey with one leg. Um, so this is bad, bad news. And um, we find a surprising amount of baleen twine in osprey nests. 
I'm going to show you, we had an osprey nest that blew down around Missoula a few years ago in a windstorm, and so I went out with some high school students, and we dissected out all the baleen twine in one osprey nest, and I'm going to show you the amount of baleen twine in one osprey nest. With the high school students, we with the high school students, we stretched all this out on the main oval at the University of Montana and measured it all. And guess how much, how long all this baleen twine is? Four thousand feet. Eighteen hundred. Oh, very good. Three miles. It's about three quarters of a mile. One dollar. In, in in one osprey nest. So you can see there's a lot. When we had it all stretched out on the, the circle in the main oval, all this orange stuff, um, somebody came up to me and said, oh, is this your Master of Fine Arts thesis? <laughs> and so I did a little interpretive dance and I, I got an MFA degree. <laughs> So the question is, are they collecting it because of the texture, the color? We've looked at this. Um, if you look through this, there's black and blue and yellow and orange. Um, it doesn't seem like they're, uh, and, and most baleen twine is orange. It seems like they're um, picking it up because it, it's nice and soft and it's good to line the, the nests with. That's, but we're also, it's fortunate that other raptors don't pick this up. So I've seen bald eagle nests next to red-tailed hawk nests, next to great horned owl nests, next to an osprey nest. You got one orange nest and all the others have none. So fortunately, only ospreys do this. We don't know why. But um, uh, here is, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with the ag community um, and we've got, um, please feel free to come up. We've got, I've made these pamphlets, and we've been distributing thousands of pamphlets um, all around to hardware stores all around the state, so people, and they get put right next to baling twine. So um, the problem is people just, most, most ranchers and farmers are really, really good. They don't leave this stuff around, but it just takes one or two dirty places, and ospreys know where this stuff is, and they'll travel miles to go get it. So this was a bad ranch um, just east of Missoula, and we went and talked to the rancher, and, and, and bought, we said, I'll, I said, I'll show up with a crew, we'll clean up your ranch. Here's a barrel, you've got to promise to put your baling twine in the barrel, don't just leave it out. Um, so we've been working with the... So have you tried a control study, because you mentioned they weren't like it. Have you ever tried a control study to change this color to black? Would it reduce this as they pick it up? We, we kind of have, but it seems Can you like... repeat that question, please? Okay. The question is, um, have we done control studies to see if they're preferring some colors over others? We haven't done a lot of work on that just because we don't want to put things out that they're going to take back to their nest and be dangerous anyway. Um, but we do see all the colors of the baling twine that's commercially available out there in their nests in the proportion that it's out in the environment. So it doesn't look like we're preferentially picking up one color over another. Um, I lost, well there's the answer. Um, I've also, we've got some, uh, you can recycle baling twine. Um, they melt down the polypropylene and make new stuff out of it. So we're starting some projects with like FFA clubs, future, so farmers, FFA and yeah, Farmers of America. Future Farmers of America, thank you, and 4-H clubs where the kids um, will go and organize these um, recycling things. We help them with it and then we give them the money back to plow into their club. And so we've been doing this for quite a while and we're seeing um, we're seeing it get a lot better. 
So the question is, would a natural fiber have the same effect? We used, like 50, 60 years ago, it used to be sisal, rope, which would break down in a year or two and wouldn't cause this problem, right? We're all about plastics these days, so. Um, but, and now folks are moving towards the great big um, hay bales, um, but uh, if that's left around, the ospreys pick that up and get tangled in this one. All right, I'm gonna zoom because um, I'm over my 30 minutes. Um, uh, we do a lot of education, so. Okay. Um, I'll drink you that. <laughs> okay, we do a lot of public education. So here's a program we did um, last year down at school in Pablo. And so we go all around Western Montana, and every time we go out um, to ban chicks, we take kids out with us. And as of last summer, we've taken out almost 50,000 people in the Clark Fork Range out to learn about the aquatic systems and ospreys and um, good stuff like that. So we're having a major impact, we, we think. Um, And this is kind of cool. Uh, two years ago, this book was published about our, our research project called Call of the Osprey, and it's all about our Montana Osprey project. So everything I'm talking about tonight and more is in here. And it was just awarded the 2016 prize for the best um, science book in the world for um, middle, middle school and high school age kids. So this was, I didn't write it, this was by Dorothy Hinshaw Patton, who's a Missoula author, um, and um, Bill Munoz, who's a photographer in the Bitterroot Valley. So this is a really cool book that's all about ospreys and the Clark Fork River and baling twine and all this good stuff. All right, I'm gonna tell you about one more thing that we've done in our sort of broader education thing, and this is our um, Osprey Nest cameras. So we put up a couple high resolution Osprey Nest cameras. This one is called the Hellgate camera. And so there's, this is right in Hellgate Canyon in Missoula. There's the Grizzly Stadium. The new College of Technology is actually right there. And um, there's a, an Alzheimer's War and Health Center right here, and you can see the camera up there. Um, I had to be sort of dragged kicking and screaming into social media when we started this program. I'm like, what is this Facebook and Twitter stuff? Um, but we have a Facebook page and people tweet. You've got volunteers all around the world who sign up and operate the camera. And um, this nest is watched by people in over 200 countries around the world. And we get millions of hits on this. And on the Facebook page, I post a ton of information just about the basic um, ecology and behavior and ecotoxicology. This. So we're reaching a huge, huge audience through this. So um, it's, it's picked up by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and their nest camera program, so you can access it through there. And see there's tweets over there, and there's our Osprey Facebook page up there. And the star of the show has been Iris. She's the female, we call her Iris. Even though she's not banded, we know it's her every year because we can zoom in on her Iris, and she's got this very distinctive pattern of dots and eyes. She's probably at least 15 or 16 years old, and she's probably fledged about 35 chicks in her life. So she's, a, she's an amazing mom, and uh, with these cameras, we get an incredibly intimate life of these ospreys. I'm learning so much more about ospreys than I've ever known, you know, 30, 40 years of studying them. So osprey, um, Iris is an amazing mother. Here she is incubating her eggs in a snowstorm in April. Here she is rather unhappily incubating in a rainstorm. Um, and she also does what we call the mombrella. So the chicks can overheat when it's sunny and hot in the summer. And, um, and osprey moms spend most of the day on the nest and um, she'll spend all day on a hot sunny day like this shielding her chicks with their wings. And she's like a sundial because she will move with the sun. 
like this, um, uh, sh shading her chicks so they don't overheat. Um, here, here she is with four chicks underneath her as a umbrella. Uh, we can watch the babies hatch. So here's a one-day-old chick. This egg is pipping, so it hatched later that day. So we can see really, really remarkable things with this camera. So I, I have seen that, but who's their predators? Is it the eagle? So who's their predators? Um, the ravens will eat the eggs if they leave them alone for 15 seconds. And um, bald eagles and ospreys are mortal enemies. They, they, yeah. So um, bald eagles steal ospreys fish all the time, and we've had a bunch of ospreys killed by bald eagles. So yeah, and there's a, the there's an eagle. The, the chicks, correct? Well, not so far. Um, <laughs> there have been osprey nests where eagles have taken the babies and eaten them. Yeah. Um, here's Stanley. Has been Stan the man has been um, was a. Uh, the male at this nest and so with these cameras we can see every single fish and get an estimate of the size that he brings in he's been what we in the scientific world call the high voltage power stud in terms of fishing uh, he was an old male um, but he was incredibly good at, at fishing even when the conditions were super super difficult like high muddy water during spring floods he could still find great big fish um, we can watch the chicks grow up. This shows that Stanley is a really good fisherman. You can see the chicks all are what we call cropped out. Those are pouches in their crops and they're full of nice and warm gooey fish. Um, here's the, those three chicks. I've grown up a little bit more. Um, we can watch them doing what we call flapper size. So they've got these huge, great big pectoral um, breast muscles but when they're chicks, they need to exercise a lot to develop those. So they actually spend about two or three weeks flapping on the nest, and you can watch them take their first tentative flights a few inches off the nest, and then finally we can watch them fledge their first flights. Um, here's Stanley. He was kind of a um, really beat up male. Um, we could recognize him. He had this wonky primary feather that was always askew. Even every year, he would molt it and would come out at this weird angle. So it was kind of neat because we could identify Iris and Stanley every year, even though um, we didn't have them banded. And so that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you and open it up to any questions. So the question is, what do these guys eat besides fish? Not much. Probably 99.9% .9 of their diet is fish. We had, um, Stanley brought in a great big crayfish, and it was fully alive, and it was snapping at everybody in the nest, and they just backed off, and it, and it flipped off the side of the nest and went back down to the river. <laughs> So the question is, it, once they grab hold of something, um, can they not release it? Um, it seems like they really do kind of have a locking mechanism, and so when they're latched onto a really big fish, they can get pulled down and drowned, as, as you saw. Uh, this might be slightly off topic, but we're talking about the range of national mercury in the green Is there any studies of mercury beef cattle? So the question is, is there studies of mercury in the beef cattle? Um, not that I know of. I, I, I think that it'd be unlikely that there's going to be mer much mercury in beef, even uh, on those cattle grazing right near, say, the Flint Creek, down in that drainage. Even if they're irrigating their hay with that water, the levels of, of mercury in that water are so low um, that it's probably not going to be a problem. The problem is, be, is when you have these top predators where you have this buildup. So I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't hesitate to eat beef from Glen Creek Valley. Uh, so I noticed that um, on Bobby's River, there's a Is that because they need the water clarity to be able to 
So that's a good question. Uh, the question was, um, there's some places in Montana where there's not a lot of ospreys like the Missouri River. I'm not sure why that is, but yeah, there are places, especially up that way. They're really common here in western Montana, the Yellowstone drainage, and then, but up in the Missouri, they're, they're not that common. Don't know why. That earlier that the females will some, sometimes venture a little further away from where they were uh, they nested or whatever. So when they, so how does that, do they kind of just spread out gradually from the areas in which they're concentrated uh, so, now? So that's a great question. The question was um, young females seem to disperse and start breeding farther than from where they were born than the males. Uh, and the question was, do they sort of wander around and disperse out? We don't really know a lot about that, and that's some of the, the data we're collecting with these satellite transmitters for the first time. Um, if Rapunzel does breed successfully next year, this will be the first time um, that anybody's followed a, a, a chick with a satellite transmitter from fledging to successfully breeding. So we're really hoping she does it next year. So we have these osprey nests over our house. They take off. Do they come back? I mean, they're always osprey nests. That's classified. It's not an eagle's nest. It's an osprey's nest. And they come back to the same yep. area. Yeah, so um, birds will come back to the same nest year after year after year. And um, and they tend to mate for life. The male or the female? Both. Both. And, yeah. And what's really neat about ospreys, we're finding with this the satellite data, so we have uh, satellite transmitters on a whole bunch of adults, the males and females at the same nest, and after they're done breeding, the male will go down to Baja, California, the female will go down to Costa Rica. They take a break! <laughs> and when I tell people, for like six or eight months, and then when I tell people that, it's usually the women in the audience that go, what a great idea! <laughs> And it's the men are like, you mean I gotta wash my dishes? <laughs> and, but what's really amazing is, um, in a lot of cases where we've got the pair, the satellite transmitters, even though they they might be wintering thousands of miles apart, like the, the osprey baseball nest, the female, um, she'll arrive, she usually arrives in the morning, the male usually arrives about 4 p.m. the same day. So they're, they, they can be very, very well coordinated. And then they, you know, they get to have like romance all over. Let me tell you an interesting story. I digress, but we, we um, this, the Osprey camera is um, right near this old folks home, right in Missoula, Riverside Health Center. And um, so we put up like a great uh, big screen TV like this in the old folks home. And so they get to see this, this feed live and, and they love it, it's huge. And so a couple of years ago, I went in and there's all these ladies in wheelchairs with blue hair and they were all going, 135, you go girl, you go, you're almost there. And I was like, and they were all, and, um, and so I asked some of the nurses, I said, what's going on here? And they said, oh, it's Osprey porn bingo. <laughs> And so, for, for about a week after they get back, they mate about every five minutes, or, or, or more, every, every minute. And so at the beginning of every day, the ladies play bingo and they bet on how many times they're going to mate that day. And so, it, and it's a huge thing for like a week, it's off straight porn bingo. And, and some of these ladies are cleaning up and making like a lot of money. And, um, yeah, so, kind of <laughs> what kind of fish? Yeah, so, um, at this nest, uh, they're eating a lot of, it, it varies over the season, a lot of trout. Um, um, a little later in the summer, a lot of white fish, and when the water levels drop, a lot of suckers. And a lot of other things as well. But I'm they're mating so much. Oh, no, when they're mating, they're not, they don't care about you. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. 
Doug. Doug yeah, knows all about the snappy nest. I just this, love that. This I year, we went up the, uh, the platform a year ago. Uh -huh. and, nothing, and nothing happened. And this year, uh, we finally got a breeding pair that arrived very early compared to other ospreys in the valley. And we were so happy about that. So the next question is, are we going to have eggs? And we had a clutch of three, but only two hatch. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I and the parents were called Duke and Duchess, and the two ships were called Lewis and Clark. <laughs> <laughs> and they, the two chicks did fledge successfully. Oh, nice. So we're hoping that they will return next year. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> hey, folks in the other room, if, if you got questions, why don't you send an ambassador over? Competition. I've noticed here in the Flathead, geese. Canada geese yeah. and the Osprey geese. Yeah. Besides um, baling twine, Canada geese is the second most common question I get. So Canada geese um, love to nest on high places, cliffs. They nest on cliffs. We're used to them nesting on the ground, but they prefer to nest in safe places because they their eggs get much easily. So in some places, Canada geese they're around all winter. And they start nesting before ospreys arrive back. So in some places, 25, 30, 40% of osprey platforms have Canada geese on them. And it can create a huge problem because for, um, so the ospreys get back and there's a Canada goose. You think who would win, an osprey or Canada goose? You do not want to mess around with a mama Canada goose. And the ospreys, they just, they won't even go near it. And they will tend to go build a nest on power lines, and then they get in trouble and get electrocuted and stuff. But what can happen is if the geese nest early enough, they at the day they hatch, the babies jump out of the nest and they're little puffballs and they bounce off and they run down to the river. And then so often if things work out, that nest fledges candy geese, and then the ospreys jump on it and breed successfully. What is the gestation? 32 days, the eggs take 32, day, 32, 34 days to hatch. So on the, on the curve that went to the low part in 1970 or 72, I couldn't read it very well. I asked whether that, that was a national curve and whether that correlated to the flat. Yeah, so, so I was just talking to Doug before the talk, and so now, in, including the Flathead River and the lake, there's well over 100 osprey nests. Um, it probably went down to 20-ish, so it it wasn't too bad compared to other places, but it, it, it did really, really go down. Places in the Bitterroot where the ospreys are much more in the matrix of agriculture where they were using a lot of DDT, um, they went locally extinct. So that um, would relate to maybe lo lower DDT levels? Probably, probably less DDT used up here. Um, to give you an idea of some of the severity, um, there were some couple famous islands off of uh, Long Island in New York, Gardner's Island and Plum Island, which had yeah. ospreys, we think of them as kind of solitary, but they can be, if there's the fish resources are high enough, they could be colonial, and these islands had like 800 pairs of ospreys. And there would be one tree with like 10 osprey nests in it, like a heron colony, and they would be nesting on the ground like gulls. And so these islands went from about 800 ospreys to the, the peak of the DDT era down to like one pair. So they, they really, really went down. How did, uh, what's the difference between an osprey nest? Oh, sorry, we got... Sorry. In the back. I'd like to put up a platform or is anybody interested in Yes. Yeah, so this is um, an, another great, great question about putting up platforms. Um, the you, you can do it if you want to pay for it yourself. Um, the power companies that used to be doing all of the putting up platforms, they've kind of backed off of that um, a little bit. Um, but it, it, it can be done, it's probably like a $2,000 project. Um, how high or how low can I make it? Oh, uh, ospreys really like it high. They like to be higher than the surrounding stuff. 
So, um, yeah, you really got to get a platform up. D Doug? The one at Snap is 65 feet high, and it costs $3,000. $3,000. Oh, yeah. What's funny is, speaking of masks, how does an eagle and an osprey nest know whose nest is whose? So the question is, how do ospreys and eagles know whose nest or whose they? Um, it is enough. Uh, that big, yeah, the, the, uh, the eagles build their own nest and they go back year after year and they tend to mate for life. The same sort of stuff. Osprey nests are big, but they're not nearly as big as bald eagle nests. So you refer to Stan as was. So if something happened to Stan, would Iris be able to find a mate at her over eight? So, yeah, I did refer to Stan as was. So Stan appeared to die over the winter. He didn't return last winter. And um, it, it was, yeah, it was kind of sad because um, um, Iris was hanging around. She was all ready to go. And uh, Stanley just didn't come back. He kept waiting and waiting. So he never showed back up. Um, this is an amazing man, uh, Louis Adams, uh, a Salish, a revered Salish elder. Um, and he died on 25th of April this spring, but uh, he was invited down to give the blessing uh, to the new College of um, Missoula College of Technology building. And so this is uh, two summers ago, Louis Adams, the osprey nest of um, Iris and Stanley is just right there. And he gave a, a traditional Salish blessing to the new educational building and he blessed the osprey nest and he also told us something rather remarkable uh, so the osprey nest is just right there in Hell Canyon his grandmother was born in one of these teepees and uh, she spent um, a, a lot of her her early life getting bitter roots and stuff this was ground zero for the Salish people before they were forcibly moved up, up to the reservation. And so, um, Louis Adams died on 25th of April this year. Um, after Stanley had, we presume, died and just never showed up, the next day, a new male showed up at this nest. And so, um, I, I thought it would be amazing to name this new male after, in the memory of, of Louis Adams, who's a remarkable man, but I didn't know if his, I was not going to do it unless his family was on board with it. And so I sort of put the word out to friends and colleagues, and um, his grandson, Ryan Adams, phoned me up, and he had taken a class with me a couple of years before, and he said, um, and, he, and he told me that they had a big family meeting and discussed this and they, they would, they, and they liked the idea. So the new male is uh, Louis. Um, yeah. Um, he's, oh, I suspect, a, um, he's kind of a klutz. I didn't tell the Adams this, but he didn't know how to mate. I, I think he's a young male, so they actually, um, she laid five eggs this year, but they didn't raise any babies. Um, but we're, but they formed a super tight bond. He turned, he's a good fisherman, and so we're really excited. Next year, we're hoping they, they get their stuff together. I think that's the perfect spot to end. I think that, that was an outstanding Science on Tap. Well done, sir. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we reached a notable milestone this evening, folks, and that's the uh, word porn showing up in the Science on Tap. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we packed the house and with reason, so uh, I feel okay about it. So, um, Thank you for, for Osprey Porn Bingo. That will be a, a, a hashtag, I'm sure. Um, let, let's hear it again, and, and thank you all for coming. Okay, if you have any interest in, in any more information, please uh, grab a brochure on the way out. I'll put them right up here for you.
Everybody see those? And uh, uh, thank you very much for coming. Very much appreciated. What a great turnout. Thank you very much.